idea, but um, I don't. I've never thought there was any reason why you know millions of people all over the world couldn't buy celibate rifles records and really get into them. I've never thought there was a good reason why that couldn't happen. So I I continue to believe that it eventually will. A believer in the faith. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, Damien. Over the course of tonight's Australian Music Show, you're going to be popping in and uh, telling us about a couple of the songs from the album mm -hmm. and we're going to kick off now with the opening song from heaven on a stick and that's light of life mm. fairly positive way to begin the album yeah yeah it, it was actually put there i think mostly as a musical decision rather than a lyrical one but yeah it's it's a very positive lyric uh it was very difficult to write uh, i find it hard to write um in a positive vein compared to a critical vein it's i find criticism very easy uh not on a personal level, but to look at things and say, well, there's a fault there and to articulate perhaps why that fault is occurring in society or, or to put forward a, a premise that sort of explains it. I'm good at that. You know, I was good at that when I was a kid. But to write positively and not sound really syrupy or sort of stupid or, you know, airheaded, I find that quite difficult. And Kent wrote the piece of music, which I really liked. It's, you know, it's a fairly simple thing, you know, basically a four chord song, but it had a great dynamic to it and uh, I just loved it. So I was trying to describe um, the reason or, uh, you know, one of the reasons that you, you get through a day, you know, the, that kind of thing when you have a really great day and, you know, that, that undeniable certainty. It, it, it doesn't have to be the word God, but um it can be a spiritual thing it can be just one of those perfect spring days or summer days when you wake up and the temperature is right and the sun is right and everything is exactly how you'd want it to be it couldn't be more perfect and those are um those are the things that really make you grateful and happy and pleased to be alive and you know uh, not not so demanding and not needing to be rewarded or whatever that day so much because you can just take the day as it is and think well how could you be better than this
the shine The diamonds are of gold If the shining eyes of faith To see a better world See a better world See a better world You got um, Rob Younger to produce Heaven on a Stick. Why did you decide to go with Rob? Because usually Kent does a lot of yeah. the production for you. Well, we talked about it from as far back as Roman Beach Party. We were going to have a producer for Roman Beach Party, but because we recorded overseas, we didn't have enough money to get one. And one of the things was we could never agree on who we wanted to produce because there's not that many people around who I hear um, producing rock records or, you know, like really heavy guitar music that I like much. Most of the production I don't like and then when I hear one that I do like it usually costs you know, a couple of million bucks or something. But um, Rob was always the obvious choice. Uh, it was just a question of when we did Blind Ear I don't think he was around and, and Kent really wanted to do it because it was a, you know, a bigger budget than we'd ever had in a really good studio and it seemed a bit mean to deny him that when he'd <laughs> produced all the other ones for like, you know, two dollars yeah. using a couple of fucking tape recorders or something, yeah. <laughs> cassette players. And uh, yeah, so this time round we just said, okay, up front, we want Rob, that's it. And um, yeah, I think it, it's worked out really well. Was there any uh, problems in terms of, I know Rob probably has a very strong affinity with the music that you play, but was there any problems in giving the control to someone else yeah heaps <laughs> <laughs> heaps we're real little grabbers but no i don't think anyone realized how attached we were to all that stuff until we tried to give it away to somebody and yeah it was uh it was a good learning experience you learn a lot about your own prejudices and stuff especially uh who you really are as opposed to who you think you are as opposed to who you'd like to be you know <laughs> all that stuff comes clear and i think it was it was at times pretty awful in there on both sides but um uh me you know a week after it's finished i only remember the good stuff i go yeah that was great i'd do that again and any creative or artistic uh venture that involves anybody other than yourself there's always going to be problems because it involves compromise and it involves people's perceptions and we're both trying to agree on the same thing which we fundamentally don't agree on so mm. but ultimately at the end of the day when you put the record on and you uh hear only the sort of the the quality results then, mm. then it influences uh what you remember from the process yeah well i i sort of to me a producer is there to produce so at the end of the day when you put it on if you like what you hear he produced it's as simple as that. Okay. Let's um, highlight one of the songs from the album, Excommunication. It has a great dynamic to it, hmm. but uh, also a fairly sad story about a, a certain girl, a, hmm. a real-life person or a, a fictional character. Well, yeah, a, a fictional character based on lots of real-life people, actually. If you were, There's a, a, a Ronald Lang book called uh, Sanity, Madness and the Family, which is 13 case history. It could be any one of those people, any one of those studies. Okay, R.D. Lang, mm. a uh, psychologist who was very much in favour, mostly in the 60s, mm. and, uh, but he was very much outside of um, the established psychological field, wasn't mm. he? Yeah, well, yeah, he, he founded the School of Anti-Psychiatry, and excommunication was one of his later theories on family illness, and he mostly worked with schizophrenics, but he found... Uh, many of the truths that he arrived at which are not really they don't really belong to psychiatry they're more philosophy as far as i'm concerned um very much extended beyond the the scope of you know let's study the schizophrenic experience uh down to let's study the life experience of everybody here we're all we're all trying to live in the same society and doing it more or less well than everybody else and a lot of his fundamental beliefs and truths I, I very much agreed with. And when I heard that he died, I just wanted to, you know, um, write a song about him. So I did that. I wrote um, Contemplating R.D. Lang. And then when I heard this blues, because it's, it's a heavy song, you know, it's got a heavy, relentless, monolithic kind of presence to me, musically. It's, it's, it's hard to know what to 
what kind of an idea to marry to that sort of music that hasn't already been done with, you know, just like witches and fairies and all that kind of <laughs> Black Sabbathy, you know, stuff. And I thought, well, that is very much what the experience seems to be like. Once someone steps outside that acceptable parameters of behaviour, what they call the good, bad, mad progression. First she was a good little girl, then she became a bad little girl because she was disobedient or, or inappropriate, heaven forbid. And people don't want to believe that their little girl or their little boy is bad, so they label them mad. And then that explains everything and it abdicates any responsibility on any part. And uh, once you step outside that, the experience of trying to live in this society is extremely grinding. And, uh, and you don't ever feel that the momentum is behind you. That's for sure. Blah, blah. And you're listening to the Australian Music Show on JJJ. Heaven on a Stick, the title of the latest Rifles album. Where did that come from? I pinched it off Philip Adams, actually, <laughs> from Late Night Live. And he was... Uh, I was driving home from the studio and I just had a particularly awful day. And uh, I'd been trying to do a... Oh, it doesn't matter what I've been trying to do, but I hadn't done it. <laughs> and I'd spent all day trying. Yeah. And um, Philip Adams had just... I think it was his second or third day in the new studio in the ABC and like everybody else seemed at that time he couldn't make the board work and he was he had this big hook up with an interview in New York and Burma and you know from someone under the ice pack in the Arctic or something and he was trying to do this three-way interview and every time he opened the channel there was nobody there and he finally said, well, you know, I'm going to try this once more, otherwise I have, you know, 55 minutes in front of me and nobody to interview and no program and nothing to talk about. And he pushed the button and this voice came through and he went, ah, heaven on a stick, he's here. And um, I just thought, that's great, that's such a funny expression. I'd forgotten all about it. I remember it when I was a kid. Oh, so it is a fairly old expression. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you hear it in New Zealand a lot, apparently. Apparently it's a, quite a popular expression down there. And it, it just means it's the best it could be or whatever, you know, today. And So that's where I got it. Yeah. And I thought I just had the same sort of day as old Phil, and <laughs> only when I pushed the button it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, look, um, what sort of expe expectations do you have with this uh, new album, Heaven on a Stick? Mm, well, I try to have none, to tell you the truth. Is that easy? No, it's very hard. It's very hard to not have expectations. Like, it's very hard to not be judgmental. But um, I try and apply the expectation of myself. That's all. <clears throat> I try and make a record that I'm proud of and, and do work that I don't think I have to sort of justify to myself or anybody else. Saying, OK, well, I've done it as well as it can be done and blah, blah. Uh, my, my hope for this is that um, it reaches people and uh, touches them or whatever, makes them think or makes them violently disagree with it but reach a point of view that that uh, is clear to them mm. it must be given that you do put a lot of work into your lyrics it must be immensely satisfying to know that it has affected people so the feedback must be pretty pretty, cru nice, pretty yeah. crucial to you it's nice when you get i got a letter from a girl the other day a 14 year old girl in newcastle who had read this article in rolling stone about me seen us at the big day out and then um read a book gone to a local library and found a book written by the Dalai Lama and read it and was now really fired up and wanted to know more and, and didn't know anybody, has no peers anywhere, you know, in, in her immediate area in Newcastle. And she sent me a letter and I thought that was great. That was really touched me. It really mm. made me feel good. So it only takes one, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Mm. It really, I mean, if everybody wrote in, you'd probably hate it and think, oh God, I wish I was... What have you started? Yeah, yeah. I'd join the shadows or something. You know? <laughs> Okay, well, the right. Uh, New South Wales, I think it is. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's New South Wales, yeah. Well, I'll check that detail. Yep. Friday at Metropolis in Brisbane, and I'll get those other dates. And uh, Saturday's the playroom, I think, and mm. Sunday somewhere up on in the Marucci sun. door on yeah. the Lula Bar or something. All right, well, I'll get those. Um, mm. a, uh, a story, I guess, about uh, exact uh, venues together, but uh, I thought just before you leave us tonight, we talk about one final track from the album, and that's Electric Flowers. Mm. A, uh, a story, I guess, about uh, another social outcast, mm. like a few of the other songs on the album. Mm. Electric Flowers. Who is this, uh, who is this character? Uh, he was a guy uh, from my childhood in, in Bondi Beach. Um, just an interesting guy. He was a, 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 the first really full-on um, addict, you know, practicing narcotic addict I'd ever met. And he was only... He looked like he was 25, and he was like 15 years old, and really ravaged. You have no idea what this guy was like. And completely 
despised by everybody. You know, especially people in in the the heroin scene looked on him as a yardstick. So it was like, well, no matter how bad things are, at least I'm not him. You know what I mean? And he pretty much internalised that. He pretty much agreed with it. And for some reason, I, I would never understand why, but uh, I didn't see him in that way at all. I saw that about him, but it was like I could sort of see very redeeming things in him. And I, I saw in him a really, like a really nice person too, a good person that I really liked and just had tremendous compassion for, I don't know why, and a lot of empathy for and stuff. And um, I also felt that of all the people I'd ever met, he had probably been more cruelly treated by life than anyone I'd come across in real life. I'd read books and seen movies about people who, had, you know, copped the raw end of the pineapple repeatedly, but to actually meet one in the flesh who was a year or two older than me was really something, you know, because it you know, meant that those people still happen. They're not just, you know, they don't just belong in films and mm. they're not just a sort of, you know, signifier for mythology. They're actually real people that life can be like that for. And um, he just touched me and I'd never forgotten. He's been dead 10 years more. He did die. Yeah. I heard a couple of years later, I was in the country at the time, and I heard uh, that he'd gone to, I believe it was Odyssey House. Uh, he'd finally decided that he actually wanted to do something about how he was, and nobody could believe it. I mean, he'd been written off 10 years earlier, but he was still alive, which was a miracle in itself. And he went to them and asked for help, and they would, they'd just closed for the day, and they said, look, come back at 9 in the morning, and you'll be admitted. And he died that night. I oh, know, really? Over the dust, yeah. And um, I don't know why, I've, I've thought of him many times in the last decade, but when I heard that piece of music, I went...